I've always been fascinated by broadcasting, and I think at the core of broadcasting is storytelling. A four-time Emmy Awards winning TV host. With over 17 years of experience in broadcast. Chris How you got that realization that YouTube is something? 2007, I made this anonymous YouTube channel because I had access to interview some of the coolest people on the planet. So I just started taking these interviews and just uploading them on YouTube. What is the evolution of content that you saw from that time to the time you posted by yourself? If you think back to the early creators, there was really not a lot of strategy. It was just like, you had an idea, you made a video and you put it up. You would sometimes flying just to record these amazing podcast interviews. I'm willing to do anything I can to make the conversation even just 1% better. Most of your podcasts are wrestling podcasts. If you wanted to start again, are you still going to focus on wrestling podcasts? And every time I did a wrestling interview, the numbers would go up. So I'm going to go all in on wrestling. So please welcome Chris Van Vliet. Hey, Chris. RJ, so good to see you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah. So good to see you as well. Hope you're having a great day. I'm having an amazing day. And th th this is what I love. We are on other sides of the planet and we are talking like we're sitting next to each other. This is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, like one thing, like I always talk about it. One thing I can tell you, uh, since I'm in the future, you're going to have a night real soon. Wow. So you can expect that, right? Okay. <laughs> you're 12 hours ahead, right? Yeah, like almost 12 hours. Yep, correct. Because it's, it's 10, 15 a.m. here. Oh, it's 11, 15 here. So like 13 oh, hours. Oh, like saving time. So you are 13 hours in the future. My goodness. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So, so good to see you. Well, I mean, you know, we already discussed, we already had the conversation in the past, but most people don't know uh, don't know about that story that it's been almost like 17 years when you were into a channel called like 979 and uh, you started your, your broadcasting experience with that, but then you somehow got into the YouTube, YouTube portal and which led for you to start creating more content consistently on YouTube and start to, you know, make this content. But can you like walk through a little bit like how your Content bug actually got started for you personally. So I've always been just absolutely fascinated by broadcasting. And I think at the core of broadcasting and the core of content creation really is storytelling. And I've always been drawn by that idea of storytelling. So I went to college for communication studies. That's what I majored in. I had this epiphany in my senior year, in my final year of college of like, man, this is really fun. I'm living with some of my best friends and we're having a great time at school, but when we graduate, you know, we have to go to work for the rest of our yep. lives. And that hit me so hard that I didn't want to have a job that I hated. I, I couldn't stand the idea of not being able to enjoy Sunday because you had to wake up for work the next morning on a Monday and go to a job that you didn't enjoy. That was the crux of all of this, RJ. It was the idea of like, I didn't want to have a job that I hated. Not that mm -hmm. I want to have a job that I liked. I just didn't want to hate my job. So exactly. You know, Long story short, I reached out to every radio station, every call or uh, TV station in my college town and just said, can I come in and see how it's done in the real world? Can I come in and volunteer? And I got an intern or a, a volunteer job at a TV station, at a radio station, and this other radio station ended up giving me a job. And that's where it really all began for me. The idea of like, what do I have to offer? Time? That's it. But what can I gain from this? Absolutely everything. So I just led with, exactly. I want to I wanna come and learn and here's what I can give you. I can give you my time and it's kind of just all taken off from there. Yeah, wow. That's that's really amazing. And then you started to, you know, oh, since, since we discussed early on, but you started to like create your own YouTube channel just because you actually got to know about like, you know, there is something like a possibility of, of having a YouTube channel. And anonymously, you started to like post that content. So like how you got that sort of like realization that YouTube is something. And I think it was about like what year that was when, when you that started your first anonymous channel? 2007, I made this oh, wow. anonymous YouTube channel. Just honestly, because I had access to be able to interview some of the coolest people on the planet. I was talking yes. to musicians and actors and comedians, people that were living their dream. And I was having these great conversations that I was pretty proud of, especially like early on in my career. But it just bothered me so much that with the traditional broadcast model, if you weren't tuned into Channel 7 at exactly 7.14 that Wednesday evening, you'd never see the interview. So I just started taking these interviews and just uploading them on YouTube because if you were a fan of that band, you'd probably go and search, search out these interviews. So that's really exactly. and for me. 
this idea of like, you had to be channel surfing and stop on that channel to watch it. Or if you're a big fan of that band, you just type it into YouTube. Oh my gosh, there's a brand new interview with this band talking about their new album. I'm going to go check this out. So that was 2007. I had this <laughs> anonymous YouTube channel that I didn't tell anybody about, but I was just like throwing content on there because I just didn't want it to go on TV once. And that was it. 2011 yeah. is when I started the YouTube channel that I have now, which is just my name, Chris Van Vliet. And it's been a 12 year journey on there. And exactly. I just have a note for anybody who is starting a YouTube channel or thinking of starting a YouTube channel. It took me seven and a half years to get that right there, to get that silver play button. And I think there's a lot oh, of wow. people start out and they go, nobody's watching. I'm not getting any views. And you just need to realize that everybody starts at zero. Everybody starts out with no subscribers and no views and you build it up from there. And if I had stopped six and a half years into that process or seven years into that process, I wouldn't, wouldn't have had that. And now I'm closing exactly. in on 400,000 subscribers on both of my channels, the main channel and the clips channel. Yes. It's a matter for me of continuing to just tell those stories and get that content out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's, that's so true of most people just got afraid of the consistency of what it actually takes uh, just to get that spotlight or that limelight, which actually is the is the hockey stick of the views or vanities or, or or whatever it is. So for you, I mean, like since you've been in the space, especially in the content side of it for so long, like what is the evolution that you actually saw from that time when you were actually anonymously posting it to the time like, you know, 2011, 2012, you posted by yourself. What is the evolution of content that you saw uh, and, and the market like sort of like shifted. I mean, if we go back to 2007 when I started that anonymous channel that you know I didn't tell anybody about, there was really no strategy to content. Yeah. If you think back to like the early creators, we're talking 15 years ago, there was really not a lot of strategy. It was just like if you had an idea, you made a video and you put it up. Now I think it's changed a lot. I think the biggest shift is consistency. I think that's a big one. You see a lot of channels that go, you're going to see a new video every Monday, or you're going to see a new video every Tuesday and Thursday. I think that that's been a really big shift. And obviously over the last, call it three years, vertical video is really leading the way. And I think people have always been drawn to short form content because I like to think of it as a taste test. Because if you're saying yeah. to someone, you've got to watch a 40 minute video or even a 20 minute video, it's a big ask. It's a really big ask. But if you send somebody a 20 second video or a 40 second video, there's a much higher chance for them to consume that. So I think a really big shift over the last few years has been the short, digestible content, the taste test, if you will. I like to think of it as a breadcrumb. I like to think of vertical mm -hmm. videos so that whether that's a reel or a TikTok or a short, I like to think of that as a breadcrumb. And if you like that, maybe you'll go seek out the slice of bread, which is a longer two to five to eight minute clip 16 exactly. by nine clip from that interview or that video. And if you like that slice of bread, maybe you'll then go looking for the loaf of bread, which is the main piece of content that created that slice and the crumb. Oh, wow. That, that's really an amazing analogy just to, just to describe the, the whole structure or the whole idea, right? In, in the beginning, uh, and I was talking with another expert like a couple episodes back. I think it was last season, Derry Leaves. Uh, so, so I was talking with Daryl Leaves and he was talking about something similar that time. Like most people were just getting viral for no reason in the, in the beginning, just because YouTube was trying to push more, more content across their platform, but then it more, you know, geared more towards the strategy side of it, uh, moving down the road. It's just so interesting. Cause if I were to send you uh, an episode of a podcast, RJ, and I said, oh my gosh, this is such a great episode. And you looked at it and the runtime was an hour and 26 minutes. You'd be like, I'm sure it's a great conversation, but I'm not going to listen to an hour and 26 minutes just because you said it was good. But if I sent you a clip from that exact same conversation that was less than a minute long, you'd be much more inclined yeah. to watch that. So that's where my strategy is. I now have, I'm super grateful to be able to say I have a team of people working under me. And that's been the coolest part of this whole thing is I think that people when they look at a content creator, they just look at the tip of the iceberg. They just go, oh man, that's so great for that person. But what they don't understand is that content creator is now able to make jobs for other content creators along the exactly. way. So maybe they're the person on camera, but now they're making jobs for people who are 
editing the videos, transcribing the videos, just editing the short form videos, all the people under that. And th that's probably been the best part of this whole journey, RJ, is being yeah. able to create other positions for other content creators who also want to do this for a living. Yeah, love it, love it. That That's really cool. So across your journey, I mean, like you've you've actually interviewed so many big names from from Hollywood. If we talk about like wrestling, you know, we all love wrestling in general. Like, have ever come that moment where you actually personally got starstruck? Be like, oh, you know, you know even though like I've done so many, like I'm starstruck at the moment right now. So like, have you ever felt that situation? I don't know if it's starstruck, but I think it's more of like the pressure I end up putting on myself because especially when you're doing a really big interview with like a huge celebrity, you got yeah. four minutes, five minutes, if you're lucky. So I think it's the more the pressure of like, is this going to go well? Is this going to live up to the expectations that I have? Four or five minutes is three, four, maybe if you're lucky, five questions. So it's like, okay, will this first question go well? And if it does, will that lead you know well into the next question? So it's more of just the pressure of like, I hope this goes well. I've got such a tiny little slice of time that if it doesn't start off well, oh my gosh, we're going to be fighting from behind to try to make this work. So I don't yeah. know if it's starstruck. I've been, my goodness, so fortunate to be able to interview some of the biggest names on the planet. Yeah, But I think it's more of just like, is this going to live up to the expectations that I've set for myself? And I, I got to say, for the most part, it's gone pretty well so far. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Got it, got it. So like how you actually handle that, uh, as you said, like it's more of a personal expectation for yourself, personal pressure for yourself, just to see like if you can able to do the amazing side of Chris, like what you set the bar for yourself, like how you actually able to handle that pressure? Because um, the problem with most people are they're like, either they get so fanboying in, in having conversation where the other person feels like that's just another fan not like a person who's having these real conversations. So how you actually handle that? When I start to dive into the research, and I think that that's paramount to any great conversation is like knowing yeah. a ton about that person, doing a lot of research. So if the conversation starts to veer off one way, you're able to follow that conversation and know what they're talking about. In doing the research, I try to find some elements that really humanize a person. Because at the end of the day, all these are, are exceptionally talented and most importantly, driven individuals who have chased after their dream and now they're living it. And I think exactly. the problem is we often look at somebody who is a rock star or uh, an A-list actor or a pro wrestler, wh whatever they happen to be, and we go, oh man, they're just it, like it's unattainable. Like we put them up on this pedestal and they don't seem real. And what I like to do is try to humanize them, try to find some moments in their life that make you go, oh, well, I struggled with something similar to that. Or hmm. I remember being where they were at at that stage of their life. And I think that that's one really important part of it. The other is you just got to remember that it's truly just a conversation with another person. Exactly. And if you were to bump into someone at the grocery store or at a party, you wouldn't be sitting there fumbling with your notes and going, okay, um, th the first thing I'm going to ask is, <laughs> is this. And then, okay, when they're done, okay, but, uh, now I'm going to ask this. You would just chat and exactly. I'd come up with a, a list of topics that I'd like to cover during a conversation. And if topic two happens to lead really well into topic eight, then we just go there and we kind of work our way back through the other topics. And I think that when people are getting started, they think too much about the structure of like, okay, we're going to do this and then this, and they're not present in the moment and they're not listening. I, I heard a great quote from the late, great Larry King. And he said, I never learned anything while I was talking. And at the essence mm -hmm. of that quote is being a great listener, actually being yeah. present in the moment and hearing what the person is saying, and then being able to follow the conversation from there. Exactly. exactly. Wow. 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 That's that's, that's really, really amazing. amazing. Uh, one, one of the main reasons reason because is like, most, most people have this tendency of like, like when, when that other person is going to finish out, I'm going to start speaking and I'm going to give my own prompt responses, responses etc. Yeah, like how many times have you been talking to someone and you know they're not really listening? All they're doing is just yeah. waiting for their turn to talk. And I think that nothing is more frustrating than that, especially when it's part of like a professional interview. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's so on point. So like for you, uh, during your whole journey, 
uh, since you've interviewed so many people out there, like how you're able to sort of like, you know, maintain that sort of relationship where somebody actually remembers who you are. Sometimes even like after having that you know, five minute conversation in an event or like quick interview, but then having them remember, like, you know, Chris, right? Like how you actually maintain that balance of building relationship with these people where they actually remember who you are. I think that actually might be the hardest part of this whole thing. And I, I really think that a really important element is trying to build rapport as quickly as you can. So if that's a, a virtual interview, it's the second that the person hops on, you, you know, you try to build that rapport and you try to remember that, like, have that energy the second it starts. If it's in person, same thing, try to bring that energy and try to build that rapport. If the cameras aren't rolling yet, you try to find some sort of common ground. Maybe you cheer for the same sports team or you have a mutual friend in common. You try to find something that makes them remember you. And look, I, I'm well aware that not everybody yep. is going to remember me. I have an interview this weekend with Ed Helms, you know, the actor from The Hangover and yes. The Office. I've interviewed him before. I'll be surprised if he remembers that we've done an interview before. And that's okay. And you know, I'll just go in this time and try to build that rapport a little bit more. And I think that that's what it is. The, the last thing you want to do is have a forgettable interview or a forgettable meeting with that person. So I think that on the other side of that then is trying to do something that makes you memorable. And I don't mean in a silly way, but just something that like links you up to this other human in some sort of way that six months down the line, six years down the line, they'll go, oh yeah, RJ, I remember you. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. That, that's really cool. And I think the, my personal takeaway around that is like do something in such a way positively so that they can remember you or just create an experience or a vibe or something like that where they actually remember you, right? Absolutely. And I feel like I'm now getting like recognition or at least having people remember me or feel like they know me from all the social media posts I've been putting out. Yes. And that's actually been really rewarding because as you know, you create so much content in a vacuum right? Like, I don't know about you, but I am sitting in an empty room right now with a camera and a computer yeah. and that's it. And it's really easy to forget that on the other side of this camera lens, there are actual people that are watching your content, whether that's live, like we are right now, or that's someone who's looking at a clip on social media or they're listening to the podcast as they're driving or working or working out or whatever. It's so easy to forget that. And there's been a few times now where someone who has like, you know, some a real level of fame is like, oh yeah, I know who you are. I've seen your videos before. And I'm like, oh wow. So like the, the rapport is being built before I've even, even met that person. And yes. that's actually something I'm I'm dealing with now that's blowing my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're actually one of those uh, persons that, that, tries to maintain that sort of like consistency of, of posting content regardless, like, like what actually, you know, matters. And uh, you do like sometimes like flying in, like just to record these amazing like podcast interviews and sometimes recording it in, in, in the, in, in the studios itself. So like how you manage that balance of handling the personal side of your stuff, but also handling the professional side that is kind of like a side by side balance. So you're right. I'm flying to do interviews because I just so much prefer doing an interview in person yeah. if possible. I also think it makes for better social content when that's an option. And I, I think the main part of my business right now is like it's the podcast and then it kind of all trickles down from there. Like the podcast is the big piece of content that also creates a long YouTube interview, but then it creates clips from there and it creates social clips from there. And then it creates you know, other things, other opportunities that come out of that. So I'm willing to do anything I can to make the conversation even just 1% better. I remember a quote years ago, and it's always stuck with me. I heard this years ago. It was, if you're willing to do what other people aren't willing to do, you're going to get results that other people aren't going to get. And I started to yeah. think about that, especially during the pandemic when, as you know, everybody started a podcast, right? Yeah. And it's funny how a lot of those have fallen off in the, you know, in the last year or two or three. So I had a podcast going into that. I started my audio version of the podcast in 2019. And then in 2020, when these podcasts started popping up out of nowhere, I was looking for that opportunity again to be able to take it out of the Zoom space and go back to either driving to do an interview or flying somewhere. Because it's one thing to be able to send someone a link. And, and, and there's nothing against this. Like you and I are literally sitting on 
other sides of the planet. It's almost tomorrow exactly. where you are. Like, I totally understand that. It wouldn't make sense for us to be doing this in person right now. But if someone lives a two and a half hour flight away and I could pay for that flight on miles or I could pay for that flight for you know a few hundred dollars, that is so worth it in the end. There's a reason why Joe Rogan is doing all of his interviews in person. It's a reason why he built out uh, all the capabilities that he had during the pandemic to make sure they happen in person. There's just something about that. So for me, the balance is like trying to just get great guests that will then create good content and then we can figure out the rest from there. Yeah, yeah, that, that approach is so powerful, especially in a way that you've mentioned that it's like whatever it takes, I have to, I have to just go and do it. Yeah, and I just think that there's a lot of people that aren't willing to do that. And I think there's a lot of people that would rather just make excuses for why it can't happen rather than looking for reasons why it can. Like, yes, a yeah. flight from LA to New York is expensive. I get it. But what if you could open up a credit card that gives you 50,000 free miles and now your flight to the other side of the country is free? And I don't think there's a lot of people for whatever reason that are thinking in those terms. Yeah, wow. I mean, like I, I actually remember that uh, one time I was planning to travel to a different city, uh, and then like something happened, uh, and then I was like, you know, let's let's screw it. But then I was like, if I I'm I'm not gonna go now, I might regret it, right? So I I just went into that city, and finally I got the chance to like interview somebody in person, which I was like, you know, having com conversation for like two years. So then we did an in person interview that time, which I didn't knew like it was supposed to happen, but it just happened just because I. I went there and I, you know, appeared over that event just to, you know, just to have that quick conversation with that person. So I mean, like that, that's truly relatable. Yeah, I love that. All I'm looking for in those situations is a yes. It's like, do yeah. you want to do this? Yes. Okay, great. I'll figure it out. I'll, you know, if you give me a date and a time, I will be there and I will figure out the rest. But all I need is a yes. And I think that especially when you're starting out in content creation, you should be seeking out that yes, because it's exactly. really difficult to be hearing all the no's when you're you know, pitching, if you have an interview show, when you're pitching for guests or you're getting no response, that is so difficult to deal with. But if you can just get that yes, you'll figure out the rest from there. Yeah, 100%. So like for you personally out there, let's say if we talk about, okay, now you got the idea, like how you're actually doing it and now you're di diversifying into like, most of your podcasts are around like wrestling podcast and then, you know, something else comes in there. That's, that's also great. But for example, if you wanted to like start, you know, again, like what would your strategy would look like? Or like, are you still going to focus on wrestling podcast? Uh, is that your uh, passion would be or? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been so fortunate to be able to interview, you know, some of the biggest celebrities on the planet, some of the biggest yes. musicians on the planet, of course, some of the top wrestlers on the planet. Also, a lot of the biggest entre entrepreneurs on the planet. And I just kept seeing in the data that the, the wrestlers were just, just kept doing so well. So I was trying to do it all. I was trying to be a show for everybody because I was genuinely interested in having all these conversations with everybody. But I was starting to see that every time I did a wrestling interview, the numbers would go up. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I can't keep fighting this. So... I'm going to go all in on wrestling. I'd already gone pretty far all the way in on wrestling, but at the same time, over the last few years, I had interviewed people like Ed Milet and Lewis Howes, yeah. and I'd done a lot of great conversations, had a, like, a lot of great conversations like that. Uh, Grant Cardone comes to mind, but they just weren't performing in the same way because I knew my audience wasn't as interested in that as they were in wrestling. So for me, I went all in on wrestling about six months ago. And my show's never been bigger. I mean, you said it in the intro, it's, it's top five wrestling podcast in exactly. the world and continuing to grow. But I will say this, what's really interesting, whatever your niche happens to be, is when you go all in on it, whatever it is, people start to notice very quickly. Like it doesn't take you doing this for a year or five years for people to go, oh, wow, you're the real estate person or whatever, you're the chef person. It's funny that the longer you do this and the more you get into it, people start to go, oh yeah, I've been noticing you've been doing a lot more stuff about real estate. And it's just a matter of consistently hitting that hammer to the nail and just continuing yeah. to do that. And people start to take notice relatively quickly. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, a lot of people have this sort of um, mindset or like, oh, you know, 
Chris has been doing it for so long. That is the main reason why he's he's really a good communicator. So like if you actually nail down like two or three things in, in general, like how somebody could be a really good communicator, uh, whether it's at Zoom or whether it's like in person, like communication is, is the massive, massive thing in of itself, right? If you master it, it's like all the things are more likely to be seen as possible. So like if you list down like two or three things, like how somebody can become a really good communicator, uh, that would be amazing. I'd say listening is number one. You, you've got to be able to actually actively listen when you have asked someone a question and, and then you can pay attention from there. Number two, and I think that this is really underrated, especially with so many people that want to be a content creator, is you got to learn to get better on camera. And mm. we all walk around now with some version of a supercomputer in our pocket all the time. Just take your phone out and record videos just for yourself. Like just hit record and start getting used to seeing and hearing yourself on camera. Because look, I know it's uncomfortable. You're seeing yourself the same way the, the rest of the world sees yourself. And yes, your eyebrow does this weird thing when you talk and one side of your mouth is higher than the other. All that stuff is yes, the way that the rest of the world sees you. And yeah, that's the way that your voice sounds to the rest of the world. If you can get used to that and start to improve on that and get better at that, that's going to be go, go such a long way, especially in the world of YouTube and content creation that we live in right now. Yeah. Wow. That, that's amazing. And it, it kind of like remembers, uh, so for me, like I had a, a piano channel, like from probably like from 2013 or 14 to uh, about like 2018, like it took me a couple of years just to get my first thousand subscribers. And I thought I'm going to do my face reveal and I never did it at all just because i was like i cannot get on camera i don't look even like amazing i don't know what to talk about stuff like that and i was like i never i never done that so but then like when i got into this this side of the space like entrepreneurship etc then i was like you know now i have to do it no other choice and then you know kind of like right right now we're having these conversations but that back then i was like i cannot even do it and i was doing <laughs> these audios and just posting on you know, plugging it with video, just uploading it because I cannot show my face, guys. I'm shy. <laughs> Look, I think you can't fake confidence. And I think that that's yeah. why I'm saying you should like just get used to seeing yourself on camera. And I think that long gone are the days of like, you need, you need to look like Brad Pitt or whoever. Like, I think that people used to think like, oh, I, I don't have a face for the camera. Like, it doesn't matter. Like content creators now more than ever, are real people just sharing their journey. It's not like scripted out stuff. It's just real people documenting the things that they're going through. Exactly. That That's exactly something like I got in my mind personally at that time after that, when I started content creation, I was like, even though my accent might not be good, like who cares? But think uh, about I'm this. the only guy who have to improve. How many languages do you speak? I'm mean, like three or four, I would say. Oh, just three or four. You know how many I speak? I speak one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, that's something you can lead with as well. Like the fact that you you are fluent in more than one language. Oh my gosh, that is such a rare quality to have. And I'm sure people that are watching this right now also have that rare quality going for you. Run with that. All I can speak is, I I live in America, but I'm Canadian. All I can speak is Canadian yeah. English. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. That, that's cool. But but yeah, like uh, truly it does make a lot of sense, especially the way that you mentioned that it's like you just have to care about your own uh, self and it doesn't matter about other opinions. And as soon as you get used to it, you just like bypassed all of them. Yeah, like focus on your strengths. Like what are you the best at? And it doesn't matter if you're not good at some other things, if you're really good at one or two things. And that's where your main focus should be. And I also think one of the biggest things in this whole conversation about content creation is you just got to start. You, you yeah. have to start. And I think that there's too many people that spend way too much time, time thinking of a great name for their channel or a great name for their podcast or coming up with a logo for it and a list of possible guests. You just got to start. And yes. as big as Joe Rogan is now, episode 2000 and whatever he's at right now, how many people do you think were listening to Joe Rogan 117th episode? Not a, Not lot. a lot. But if you were at episode 117 of your podcast right now, you'd be pretty pumped. So I think the idea is you just got to start and then you just got to keep going from there. Yeah. 
exactly. So recently, I think it's been about a month or so, like you and Travis, uh, Travis Chappell, like most people know about uh, him since he's been on the podcast. You guys have actually launched full-time creator mastermind. I've been the part of it. I'm loving it. Uh, so like, for the people out there who don't know about it, can you like elaborate a little bit more what what it's all about? Who is it for? How somebody can also join that as well? Yeah, you're one of the OGs. So thank you for being yeah. one of the original members, a full-time creator. So Travis and I have both in the, been in the creator space for a decade or more. And almost every day, we get people hitting us up going, can we pick your brain? Can we ask you a question about this or that? And I want to help everybody. I want. I, I. I truly think that if you want to do this, everybody could be a content creator. So we're we built out this mastermind. So we're letting people know everything that we've done, including all the mistakes. We're dumping this all into one place and teaching you everything that we know, so that you can expedite your process of being a content creator. And I yeah. think there's a lot of people, especially now, who do not enjoy their jobs. I get it. And that kind of circles back to what we were talking about at the start of this episode. But if you could have something, maybe it just starts on the side as something that could make some money on the side as a content creator, something that you're really passionate about that could grow into something more so that you could become a full-time creator. I think that's the dream for a lot of people. So True. we've set up the full-time creator mastermind at fulltimecreator.co. So if you want to go check that out, you can join for a dollar for the first two weeks and see if you like it, see if you get something out of it. I'd be shocked if you didn't. And it's been really cool seeing people in the group already starting to grow and make some really big wins as a content creator. And I think that one of the most difficult parts about being a creator or being an aspiring creator is you feel like you're doing it alone. And the cool thing that exactly. we built out with the mastermind is here's a whole bunch of like-minded people at various stages along the game who are doing the thing. So you can feel like you're among other people, among, among other like-minded people who are doing the same thing that you want to do. Love it, love it. Yeah, as you guys, as you mentioned, like I've been the part of it from from the beginning of of full time creator mastermind, and yeah, you know, I, I'm loving it. You know, it it's really good, especially with the people and like hanging out with you and. Uh, with Travis and other experts over there, which is absolutely amazing. And as you mentioned, like most people in some cases might never get the chance of, you know, interacting or asking those questions and get that answer from them, which they actually just need just to get motivated or just to take that action. I remember when I was starting off as a broadcaster. So before YouTube was even a thing, I just wish I had someone that was able to kind of guide me along a little bit. And I didn't have that. I didn't have someone I could reach out to and say, what's the next best step for this? Or how do I do this? I had to kind of figure it out on my own. And I think in hindsight, it probably stunted my growth a little bit as a broadcaster because I was making those mistakes and realizing, oh, that's not the way you should be doing it. You should be doing yeah. it this way instead. I love, one of the things I love the most about full-time creator is the Q and A's we do at the end of every lesson because people are like struggling with something. Maybe they've been struggling with it for months and they go, hey, what's your take on this? And both Travis and I with similar but very diverse backgrounds are able to give our input on this and hopefully uh, allow you to be able to come to a solution on something a lot quicker than if you tried to trial and error it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, guys, first of all, I will post up the link in the description down below, also in the show notes, so you guys can be the part of it. I'm already there, so I would love to hang out with you guys. Uh, and also, I'm going to post up uh, Chris's socials down below. If you're not following Chris or living under the rock, like you better go and follow. Well, uh, the last question I want to ask is, uh, what's next for you? Like, What's your goal that you're heading to right now at the moment? I think I, so the biggest thing is every day. I feel like every day is the new goal. And my goal in life has just always been to be excited for what I'm going to do that day. And then at the end of the day, to be proud of everything that I did that day. And then the next day it resets and we do it again. But I've got my eyes set on a gold play button. I so badly want to get a million subscribers on YouTube. And my CVV Clips channel, where I yes. post clips in the most interesting moments from my interviews, that's been growing pretty steadily, like around 1,000 subscribers a day. So oh, wow. we're closing in on 400,000 subscribers there. That's definitely something, and I've got it written down on my whiteboard. You you might remember that from one of our last yes, calls. I remember. I've got it written down here. On October 21st, I had 353,808 subscribers. 
we're already at 372,000. So we're 19,000 above that. So continuing to grow that, the gold play button is definitely a goal. But honestly, it's just to continue to grow every single day and to be grateful for the opportunities, like to be present enough to go, man, this is really cool to be able to do this. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really amazing. And I remember there was a quote, and I posted like a couple couple of weeks ago. It was something like, "Do it every day as if it's day one." Mm, I love that, and it's so true because I think that whatever it is that you're doing, I think that it's so easy to get caught up in like, "Oh, here we go, it's another day." Whereas, like, especially when you're a content creator, it's pretty cool to be able to do this all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Chris, it was so amazing to talk to you having this conversation. Any last thing that you want to say before we round the show up? I want to say congratulations to you and everything that you've built out here. And I don't know if people know this. I don't know if we put it out there, but we will now. You've been editing together the trailers, the intros for all my interviews, and you have been crushing it. So I want to say thank you for that. And thank you for this space here right now to be able to share this conversation. Truly appreciate it, man, you know, uh, for giving us the opportunity. And it was so cool to hang out with you. I can't wait to hang out once again in full-time creator mastermind. So yeah, guys, like just join that out. The link is going to be in the description, also in the show notes down below. Well, Chris, thank you so much. And guys, we're definitely going to see you guys in the next episode. Until then, peace out.